Good morning. So uh, today we are going to continue in Hebrews once more. Again, we are inching ever closer to the end of this book. I thought we were going to be going, I thought we were going to be getting done a lot quicker too, but it's like, it's just stuff is deep and we got to dive in, you know, and today's no different. Uh, it, it's in, in Hebrews chapter 12, where we left off last time, we were talking about discipline. And we kind of came to the conclusion that you're an illegitimate child unless you're disciplined by God. And we had to kind of reason out what's the difference between punishment and discipline so that when we receive his discipline, we don't look at God with some square face and, and have to ask why me? Because the legitimate question is why not me? I'm his son. And to be grateful for the things that we go through so that we can, in the same way that the people in Acts you know, were to withstand uh, beatings and 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 scorn were pouring on their heads. They they were they said that it was pure joy that Jesus would allow them to suffer for His sake. And so, you know, and whether you would call that discipline or not, I don't I don't know. But the reality is, if there's things in your life that's going on and you feel like. You feel like you're being punished. It might not be punishment. It's probably discipline. And so what we're going to do today is kind of segue out of that and into the rest of chapter 12. And it, it doesn't have just one point. There's several points. And so we're going to talk about several different things that aren't necessarily related to one another. Starting in verse 12 to 15. I want to read this to you first. So 12, 12 through 15. It says... Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it may become defiled. Let's tackle that first. First, you know, in, in verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. This is a big debate every time I've already made a video about it, but whether or not a true, genuine believer can fall from the grace of God. Um, and, you know, I, I believe based off of evidence that we've seen in Hebrews and other parts of the Bible that it's absolutely, it's absolutely possible to be a son and then not be a son. Not because of anything God has done. God did everything. You're saved by grace. But we can actively reject him. It says that no one can take him from his hand, but there's nothing, there's no rule saying we can't jump out, Right? That the world can't deceive us to a point where, you know, we want to follow our flesh over God, you know. And so, you know, in in, in Galatians five four, I don't want to beat this dead horse, but you know, in in Galatians five four, I mean, it's a scary verse. I mean, it says, I mean, it's literally, you know, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. I mean, it's. And that's not the point of, I don't want to focus on that at all, but, you know, it's just something that you don't want to live in fear, but you also do want to have a healthy fear, because that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is fear. Um, so what is a root, go, just go on a, away from that, okay, because I do not want to focus on that. Root of, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. What is a root of bitterness, and how can we... How can we avoid this in our life? A root of, avoid a root of bitterness. How to avoid this? I think you look no further than the verse preceding it. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I think that's how you keep roots of bitterness from coming up in you. You seek peace with everyone. Now this is a big deal. Especially in the modern day age of Facebook and the fact that you can argue with someone without having to face them, 
without me having to look in your eye. That's why people get all bold in cars and they honk horns and they lose their minds at a red light because they don't think that that person's going to get out of their car and come confront them. Okay, they feel safe in their little vehicle. Okay, so they don't feel like, they feel like they can be controversial with no consequences. And so the truth is, is they're not striving for peace with everyone. Like that, you have a horn to avoid hitting someone, let them know you're here. Not to shame someone, right? You crazy drivers out there are probably disagreeing with me right now, but that's okay. Strive for peace with everyone is how to avoid a, uh, a bitterness from springing up. So let's go to some verses that are kind of on point with that. Look no further than Matthew 18, 15. And I'm going to be flipping around a lot today because there was just so many different topics. So Matthew 18, 15 says this. And y'all aren't going to like this. I don't like this. I don't like this commandment. But this is a way to make peace with everyone. This is one way. I'm going to give you two, or Jesus gives you two. Matthew 18, 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Not on Facebook, not on Instagram, maybe on the phone, but you're going to have to confront this person. Go tell him his fault between you and him. Don't blast him publicly on some social media site. Okay? Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So this is the importance of having, if you're in Christ, having friends, being in a life group, having a close-knit friend, sharing friends. Because if two other friends say, hey, like, yeah, he, he definitely screwed up. Like, get them involved. Say, hey, man, like... You know, this is this is what's going on. I feel like, you know, there's some bitterness here and I'm trying to resolve that. I don't understand why you're not, you know, you're not admitting to what you're doing. You're not forgiving me. I'm not forgiving you. I mean, well, not us forgiving you because you know what I mean. I mean, th there's just confrontation that we're called to. Um, it, it says, after you take by the evidence of two or three witnesses, it says, if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be with you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Let him be with you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I mean, it's like, you know, we don't like that. We don't like that. But that's what Scripture says. If we're going to embrace all of it, then there it is. Matthew 5, 23 speaks to this also. How to avoid bitterness in your life. Matthew 5, 23. Um, Matthew 5, 23 says this. So if you are offering your gift at your offer and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge. So look, what it's calling is it's calling for urgency, okay? Because what's at stake here? We're talking about the step. What's at stake is relationships. Another thing that's at stake is clearly someone's soul. Here's the deal: if if you don't forgive somebody on earth, it says the same measure of mercy that you give others on earth will be given to you in heaven. That's what Jesus said. The same mercy you have on others here on earth will be given to you in heaven. So, so you you're not going to be quick to 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 get out that root of bitterness. Well, you better be. It's a big deal. And it says, and then right after that, you know, it says, you know, preceding that and, you know, after it, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Like, I mean, you're going to have to struggle through that as someone reading scripture as to why that's placed there. And I just, I don't think that you can call yourself a Christian and like go throughout your life having grudges against people. I don't think it's possible. That's living an unrepentant lifestyle. That's claiming to be one thing by your actions and or claiming to be one thing, you know, to Christ. And then, you know, you are saying to him you're something else by your actions. So you got to, you, you, you got to, you got to listen to scripture. You got to follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. If you feel him calling you to go to a brother today, then you got to do that. You got to, even though it's awkward. Pray beforehand. It's out of your hands 
after you go to him and do what God's asked you to do. Okay? So, so, so there you go. So let's keep going into, um, let's keep going. That's kind of the, the one of the first points. Uh, but then it goes into, I just kind of kind of keep reading because it goes directly into another completely different point. So I'll keep reading in verse 15 and onward. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So Esau, we, we know that, that Isaac was the father, it was Esau, and it was Jacob. And, and Esau was the, first, was the firstborn, and he had a birthright, and he gave it up for a meal. Okay, and not good. Okay, not, not good at all. So this is what it's trying to say. You're giving up something precious for something that doesn't matter. You know, when it says unholy like Esau, that no one is sexually immoral even, I mean, think about it. You're potentially giving up injuring the temple that God wants to dwell in for a fleshly desire. It's just trying to draw the distinction between something precious, giving up for something cheap, and and not not special at all like joining yourself with somebody outside of the confines of marriage like that is just it's it's so not special giving it up for the most special thing but what's even what's even more you know in terms of a point is for you know that afterward after after Esau sold his birthright afterward he desired to inherit the blessing he wanted it back but guess what it says he was rejected for he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. Now, I don't think it's saying that God didn't allow him to, like God didn't allow him to repent. I don't think that's what this is saying. I think if you look at the commas and the way that the author is saying it, it's saying that he sought his birthright for tears, but he just didn't find a chance to repent. So essentially, it's like saying, I wanted that job, but I didn't find a chance to apply to it. Or I wanted that job, but I didn't take the chance. I didn't have. I didn't have the chance to take the boot camp necessary to qualify for it. You didn't make time for what was important, and as a result, you didn't receive what you wanted. Does that make sense? Like that's what it's talking about here. I think it makes far more sense with the context of what we're what we're looking at. So he desired something. He didn't make time to repent. So here's the question that we want to talk about today is what is the main reason that people don't repent? Why is it that people don't see the error of their ways? They acknowledge the fact that God created the universe that looks to people, looks to all the evidences around and says, hey, like not only does he exist, but he calls me to repentance. He calls me to himself to be holy. Why can't people get that? And I think there's a lot of reasons. Um... I think there's a ton of reasons, but I think one is lack of fear of God. And we're going to, these other verses that we're going to get into in a minute is, uh, are, are, are super revealing of who God is and why he should be feared. But first, let's just, let's just kind of talk about some, some verses in scripture uh, where we see there being a lack of fear or fear that drives you to obedience. Because here's the deal. Love is the driving force. And we're going to talk about how the fear of God plays into the verse 1 John 4, 18, where it says perfect love casts out all fear. We're going to talk about how they, how they relate. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. Fear leads us to obedience in the beginning and throughout our lives as Christians. But love is the ultimate motivator. But fear is the initial motivator, I think. Because you don't know, you got, you fear your, you can love your dad before you fear him, but you don't know to obey him until after he has disciplined you. 
He puts fear into you, and as a result of putting fear into you, then you come to being obedient. Then your love for him increases as a result of your coming to a fuller understanding that his discipline means he loves you even more than some tiny, tiny love that, you know, you don't, you don't care about me enough to discipline me so that you can keep me from harm. Like, that's what God's doing. He's saying, like, I love you so much, I'm going to discipline you. But my discipline, for lack of a better term, sucks. Like, so, like, fear it, you know? And, and you know, how about this? Let's, let's just read off a couple things. In, in Genesis 42, 18, uh, Joseph wins his brother's trust when he declares that he is a God-fearing man. So God, a, a man that fears God, is a more trustworthy man because he's being held accountable by someone other than himself. Okay? Someone other than himself. Okay, if you're just worried about a man or a woman or this earth catching you doing something, don't. Don't. Like, if you have a, an ultimate judge, then I'm gonna be able to, I'm gonna be able to, to trust that person a lot more. And he was so he he was counted as as that. Uh, so it was because the midwives feared God that they obeyed him instead of the authorities by sparing the Hebrew babies. That was Exodus Exodus one seventeen. So through fear, they were they obeyed God. Um, Pharaoh, here's a really good one we need to talk about. Pharaoh brought disaster on his nation because he did not fear God. That's what it says in Exodus 9, 19, or 29 through 31. 29 through 31. Because of a lack of fear of God, Pharaoh brought disaster on the nations. If there's no fear of consequence, if we're prescribing to relativism where we're our own God, we make our own moral law, we are the lawgiver, there is, there is no one outside of ourselves that tells us what to do because we are the king, we are Pharaoh, then what's to keep us from doing anything? Pharaoh didn't fear anybody, not a man, not, a, not God. And so what, what about in, in um, Moses? He chose leaders to help him on the basis that they feared God and wouldn't take bribes. It says that in Exodus 18, 21. You get the point. You obey God, at least in the beginning, through your fear of him. And, and so, you know, the question kind of remains then, how do you square 1 John 4, 18 with... Fearing God. So listen, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And we see his love for us in the person of Jesus through a self-sacrifice of a God on high that came in flesh and blood, that died, that took on the sin of humanity and was raised again to new life so that we have a promise that we would raise again to new life if only we remain in him. And how do you remain in him? Because you walk in him. That's You walk with him is how you remain in him. That's it. We went over this. We went over this all the time. That's in 1 John chapter 2. By this way, we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And how did he walk? He walked in humble obedience to God in Philippians chapter 2 that he says that he humbled himself to a servant, to God. He took the position of a lower figure and he came to serve his own people. In the same way, we are to serve the least of these so that we serve him also. Like, that is the calling. That's how we remain in Him. And, and we do that out of love. We do that out of love, yes. But it, it's Jesus didn't have to fear God, right? He feared for us. That's why He came. But we fear God. And we have to understand who God is or we're not going to fear Him. And we're going to talk about who God is in a minute and why He's worthy of not only our fear but our love. We're going to talk about that too. But first, before we go there, I want to go to Matthew 10, 28. So in, in Matthew 10, in Matthew 10, 28, uh, it just kind of goes down this, this, this kind of fear again. 
Um, Matthew 10, 28, uh, it says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So, like, people are scared to death. Why don't they repent? It's because they don't want to live under consequences. They don't want to believe that their life has consequences. They don't want... They don't want to compare themselves to a perfect God. You know, it's not that it's not that they're incapable of repentance or God hasn't given them an opportunity to repent. It's that their response, their response isn't there. They don't want to be held accountable. And to live under God is to be held accountable. I mean, it really is. One day you are acknowledging that every knee shall bow and you will be judged. And as a result, that, that's a hard pill to swallow for people that want to do their own thing here on earth. And if that's the reason, just say it. Like, don't make up some excuse that there's not enough evidence for God or something. Like, just tell me that, just tell me that you want to do your own thing and be academically honest. Like, I can respect that a lot more than somebody who looks around and says, well, there just isn't enough proof or enough evidence of God or, or there, you know, I, I just, I don't believe that he's the God that you're talking about through Jesus. Like, don't give me that. Like, there's more than enough historical and archaeological and philosophical and scriptural and manuscript evidence to come to the conclusion that God is who he says that he was. So 2 Corinthians 7.1 says this, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. How are we made holy? We're made holy by being sanctified by God. Okay, we are made holy through the sanctification process of God continually disciplining us throughout our life and our response to that and our repentance, like continuing to examine ourselves and see where we're going wrong. That whole time we are in him and we're under the waterfall of grace. This isn't legalism. Okay, I'm talking, you're covered by the waterfall of grace the entire time I'm talking about this stuff. If you are truly seeking him. But bringing holiness to completion is the understanding that God has the ability. He has the ability. He is the ultimate judge to judge you. People don't like that. And that's why they don't find time to repent. One more, one more, one more verse and then we will move on. It's in, it's in Romans 3.18. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's worth beating. If you don't get it, it's kind of like the old preacher said, When are you going to stop talking about repentance, Jeff? And he said, well, Tom, I'm going to stop talking about repentance. When you repent, see you next Sunday. You know what I mean? So it's like, this is, this is worth going over. You know, what about Romans 3.18? It says, there is no fear of God before, it says, well, their feet are swift and they shed blood. In the paths they are ruined and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So, it kind of is a perfect way to end this because if we're going back to Hebrews and it says to seek peace so that no bitterness comes up and then it alludes to Esau not repenting, then it says that, you know, it says in Romans 3 that we just went over that, you know, they're not seeking peace and as a, because they don't have a fear of God. If you're not seeking peace, you don't fear the words of Jesus when he says that the same amount of mercy that you give to others on earth, I will give to you also in the end. That's something to fear. That's something to be cognizant of. If you keep going down in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, For you have not come to what, uh, or Hebrews chapter 12 verse 18. You know, it. I'm just going to read this to you because it, it's just, it, it's who God is and you just got to accept it. It's talking about the people in Exodus coming out of Egypt. And it says that, you know, they could not endure the hearers that beg for no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I trembled. But you, so it was talking, I actually skipped a verse in verse 18. For you have come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. Essentially, what these verses are doing is this drawing out a distinction between how scary God is, 
Because if you go back to Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, you know, it says, it says, do not let God speak lest we die. They were so scared of how loud he was. It says that God spoke in thunder. And like, it's scary. Like he's an all-consuming fire. And, and, but these people didn't respond you know, and then it draws a distinction when you go down a little bit further in verse 22. It says, but you, you audience that I'm talking to have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in a festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of righteousness made perfect in heaven and to God, the judge of all. It says, and to Jesus, it says, and made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So essentially, he's drawing a distinction. If you're his, you can approach him boldly. There's nothing to fear if you're his. Fear brings you to this point. You work out your salvation in fear and trembling, sure. But you are to approach the throne with boldness and with confidence because you are his, Right? It becomes not just a fear, but it becomes a healthy fear when you're his. The same way a child has for his father. He doesn't think his father's just going to beat him for no reason. A good father never would do that. So remain in him. Have a healthy fear and a knowledge of who he is. He's, he's never changing. He still is scary. He still speaks in thunder. But he's also the God that came in the form of flesh to save you from your own sin. He's both. He's both. And we're to respect both. We're to acknowledge him as our savior. We're to also acknowledge him as someone who can be feared and as our king and as our Lord and as someone that will judge. But also someone that saves. Also someone that's kind and gentle and loving and long-suffering. Those two are married. In the same way we have different parts of our personality, so does God. And so keep going down. One, one, one last point. One last point is in verse 26, it says this. At the same time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is things that have been made in order that the things cannot be shaken may remain. So instead of reading that, you can go read that. It's just you know, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. What can't be shaken? Our faith. What can't be shaken? It's like our faith. You know, I think about in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, when it talks about the house built on the firm foundation, the winds came and the floods, and the floods came, but the house remained. But the house that was built on the sand faded away. You know, we're to build our foundation on Jesus Christ. We are to have faith in Him. And as a result of that faith, when our life shakes, our faith will remain. And that's what we're judged by. You are to work so hard for the Lord that there is very little left of you at the end of your life. That you have become so holy and that you have become so like Him through a lifetime of efforts. Efforts of wanting to please him, not earn your salvation, because you can't do that, but to please him because of the great gift, the free gift of grace that he has given you through his son Jesus. Because of that, you're going to become more like him. And when you are shaken, when the world shakes you, when the world tests you, then guess what? Your faith is going to remain. And that's what it's talking about. But we also have to respond and if you go back up to verse 25, it says, See that you don't refuse him who's speaking. For if, they did, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. So I love this verse because somebody might be calling you. Somebody might be calling you. I'll say this. I've referenced a guy named Buddy Bell on here all the time. I'll reference him again. He was absolutely pivotal in my, in my coming to Christ, in my finally repenting. He never stopped chasing after me in the midst of my rebellion in my 20s. He was a preacher. 
in Montgomery, Alabama. And he would constantly ask if I would go to lunch with him and he would never judge me even though he gained my trust and then I would tell him these outlandish things that I were doing and the sin that I was caught up in and he never judged me, he just loved me. He warned me. He encouraged me. He spurred me a bit. But he never judged me and he never let go. And I was rejecting him. I was, I, I was rejecting God. See to it that you don't refuse him who's speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned him on earth, much less will he escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Moses was the one in question here. I mean, don't get it. I'm not talking about buddies Moses. Moses, Moses, even though he is getting a little old now, he starts looking like Moses. So I hope, I hope you, you heard that. I hope you're watching this. So, so check it out. I mean, it's here's the deal. If somebody's coming to you and talking to you about God, if you're watching this video and you've gotten 30 minutes in, I believe that people who are filled with the Holy Spirit are extensions of God's hand. And that's why it's so very important not to reject those who come to you in the name of Christ because you could quite literally be rejecting God because God is using his vessel through the power of the Holy Spirit to reach out to you and love you. You should be flattered when somebody is coming to you and talking to you about God because I believe that's God reaching out to you. Be flattered by it. Don't think it's somebody just crazy coming. That's God doing it. He already came in the form of man and forgave you of your sins and now he's having to use another man to come to you and convince you that I love you. I love you. He's already on record for how much he loves you but sometimes he has to use a man or a woman to come to you and say, I love you. He speaks through us. People position their lives. People position their lives so that so that he can, I guess, solidify once more the love that he has for you. And I just want to, I want to, one last thing in Acts 17, in Acts 17, 26 through 27, you know, it talks about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit positioning himself and then empowering people. How about this? Let's just do a formal shout out. I don't want this to go much longer. Acts 17, 26 through 27 and Acts 1 through 8. How about this? Fact check me. The Holy Spirit positions himself in your life so that the things that you chalk up as coincidence aren't coincidence. It's God functioning in your life outside of time, creating everything perfectly in your life foreknown to give you the best possible opportunity to repent, to come to him, to fear him, to love him. He empowers those around you in Acts 1.8. He gives people the power to come to you in boldness. He gives you the power to go to people in boldness. So if you need to go to somebody in boldness today, and you need to tell them like, hey, I'm here for peace sake. I'm, I'm here to give you peace. I'm here to bury the hatchet so that God will accept my the sacrifice of my life. I'm here... I'm here not because I want to prove a point. I'm here because I want you to forgive me and I want to forgive you and I want to move on as friends and brothers. If you want to do that, like, do it. The Holy Spirit is working in your life and prompting you to do something like that, then do it. If somebody's talking to you about God, accept it. Accept it for whatever it is. Fear God. It's massively important. It's massively important. Anyways, go figure out a way to love somebody. Um, thank y'all so much for following along in Hebrews. And I just think God has so much to say in Scripture. And um, I am privileged to be able to, to bring it. And so I love y'all. Go figure out a way to love somebody today. Be bold. Fear God. But you know what? Let perfect love cast all that out. If you're his and you're in him, there's no reason to fear. I love y'all.